Well, ho hello and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to uh, talk today. Uh, my name is Martin Landre and I'm uh, accompanied by Rachel Hallett, who will um, be joining us uh, in the presentation a little while later. I want to start with a slide I've used for many years, which is really thinking about uh, clinical trials uh, in the context of medicine. And I think we have to start with the philosophy that and the recognition that clinical trials are essential for making uh, informed decisions about the benefits and harms of particular treatments or vaccines uh, and other medical interventions. And so many decisions are made in the absence of that reliable evidence, perhaps because the trials were never done or because they were not done well. Uh, they were badly designed, badly conducted, badly analysed, badly reported or badly acted upon. And those decisions uh, will harm individual patients, they'll harm uh, public health. And so we really need a clinical trial system that is able to generate the evidence for better medicine at an individual and a public health uh, level. But clinical trials have hit something of a crisis. And if I think in the broader context than just today's meetings, if you think about new treatments for heart disease, for example, many trials, single trials, cost in excess of $1 billion, the consequences of which are those drugs become unaffordable, or many potential treatments are simply not developed because a $1 billion is too much, even for a very large commercial organisation. There's also been the uh, growing success, at least from their point of view, of the contract research organisation industry, which over the last 30 or 40 years has grown from nothing to now $30 billion per year in 2015 and rising exponentially at about 10% per year. Many trials, as I've said, are doomed to failure through bad design. And Janet Woodcock, who's uh, Deputy Chief Commissioner of the FDA, did an analysis of 2,900 clinical trials uh, of treatments for COVID and found that only 5% of those were actually had any hope of answering their question. The remaining 95% were badly designed or um, under, underpowered. In cardiovascular disease, again, uh, to use an example, uh, Rob Califf, who in fact is uh, uh, commissioner of the FDA now, did an analysis that found that only 15% of all the clinical guidelines for cardiology were based on good evidence from trials. So many of the decisions we make in cardiology, arguably the best um, specialty in terms of evidence-based medicine, many of those um, uh, treatment decisions are not based on good evidence. And the consequence of all this is that uh, industry has by and large uh, moved away from treatments for common diseases towards treatments for rare diseases. And that's important and there have been some huge advance advances there. But it doesn't begin to tackle the major challenges of public health, actually, frankly, either in the higher income setting or the lower income setting. This problem has been picked up and was um, was exemplified during the COVID uh, pandemic uh, and particularly the height of the COVID pandemic, when, as I say, there were so many trials that produced so little information and one or two trials that produced uh, really uh, robust information that had a profound effect. And the G7 uh, put together a, uh, a paper on what it would take to prepare for the next uh, pandemic and what we, steps we should take in place, put in place now. And of particular relevance for today's discussion, they emphasise that we really need to refocus regulatory guidelines on the fundamental scientific and ethical principles that underpin randomised trials. We need to think about the flexibility and innovation across a range of health threats, technologies and locations and that the GCP guidelines should be revised to focus on what matters for the generation of actionable information rather than simply what is easy to check and needed to place an emphasis on the principles and purpose rather than on process and I would say on simply just on documentation. The WHO has also picked up on this and uh, a resolution was passed in May this year picking up on very much the same th theme of why we needed better regulations, better clinical guidelines for clinical trials that was actually improve um, the quality of evidence that's being generated. So it's worth taking a step back and thinking, what does good guidance look like? Well, first of all, this must be based on good science good and good ethics, focused on the issues that materially will influence the well-being of the patients in the trial, 
and the reliability of the results, which of course will influence the care of future patients who are not in the trial. The second is that guidelines need to be clear and concise. Anybody can write more. The key is to write less uh, and so that actually people can apply the guidance in a range of settings. It needs to be inclusively developed, co-developed with regulators, of course, and funders and the commercial academic um, clinical trials sector, but also with clinicians and patients in the public from uh, across a broad range of disease settings, a bro broad range of healthcare systems, a broad range of economic and other backgrounds. And the guidance needs to be progressive and durable. We're not trying to regulate for the trials of, of the past, we're trying to regulate for the trials of the future. And the details, the operational details will vary in the future, uh, but the principles will stand the test of time. And that I think is the test of whether we've got our guidance right or not. So really the good, good guidance needs to focus on the why, not the who, the what, the where or the how. It needs to emphasize those principles and major considerations recognize that many trials really have no additional risk on top of the risks associated with normal clinical practice, that we they can build on the strengths of the routine healthcare systems and the standards to which healthcare organisations and even individual healthcare practitioners are held, and allow trialists to determine for themselves what's the most efficient and effective way of addressing the principles in the, con in the particular context of that particular trial. We must dis discourage excessive or defensive practices that drives up cost, increases complexity, reduces sample size, reduces the quality of information. And documentation, writing something down, is often important, but it is not the same as quality. And so the Good Clinical Trials Collaborative was set up uh, two or three years ago now, uh, initially funded by the Wellcome Trust and the Gates Foundation, uh, to develop new guidance. And we really took those same principles to heart of uh, making sure that these guidelines were co-developed by a broad range of stakeholders from a broad uh, range of organizations, uh, communities uh, and, and uh, many different parts of the world. We went on from that having uh, developed the guidance to then look at um, uh, and get a broad public consultation including some uh, uh, deliberative uh, input from a range of organizations to try and improve the guidance. And so that leaves us with a set of uh, uh, guidelines which have four major principles. The first of all is that good tri trials are informative and relevant. They respect the people who are in the trials. They're collaborative and transparent. They respect the people and the communities in which the trials are, are, are set. They're feasible for their context and they manage uh, uh, the quality uh, and the information efficiently uh, and with the appropriate level of care and due diligence. And I'll hand over to Rachel to, to, to take us forward from there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, so um, I'm just like, like to uh, show you a little bit more detail. So under those five key principles that Martin's just outlined, um, what you can see in the guidance itself is actually some underlying topics. Um, and we won't be going through, of course, the detail here today, but this is just to show you under those five key principles, um, with the collaborative approach, uh, we have drawn out um, several or 27, in fact, topics that will fall under those headings. And that's something that, um, it's, that you can have a look at on our website now. The guidance is downloadable um, in several key languages alongside English, and we're planning to translate into others. So you can get a feel for what those um, key topics are, uh, where they fall, and um, as Martin mentioned, the why each uh, is important in determining what a good clinical trial looks like. So moving forwards now, um, what, we'd, what I'd like to just take the last few minutes to, to discuss is uh, what the uses for the guidance we hope will be and the activities that we're, that we're now embarking on to help promote um, and advocate for the guidance. So really uh, the guidelines uh, underneath the principles are broadly applicable, um, as Martin has suggested, to a whole range of uh, stakeholders. And we hope that everybody working within the clinical trials community will see um, uh, areas in which they might be embedded, whether you're developing a trial, a protocol, whether you're a participant, uh, whether you're a regulator and a funder. There are elements there that describe good practice and why certain aspects are important um, throughout the whole uh, workflow of a typical trial. Uh, and these are trials, as we've said, in all settings uh, and for any healthcare intervention. 
<clears throat> so we hope that we'll begin to use them to inform policy, to start embedding them within uh, practices uh, and see some uptake um, across the whole trial ecosystem. So current activities um, to try to uh, to promote these are shown here. So we're looking, um, as we've said, with a whole range of different audiences that we are would now like to have start conversations with um, and to try to see where we have complementarity uh, and where um, alignment uh, with our principles will really help to um, so sort of um, overcome various challenges that are, are well described in the literature. Something that I'm going to be involved with are capacity strengthening activities um, and what we'd really like to do is to start partnering and, and um, involving people, as I've said, across the whole trial ecosystem. So uh, this is really uh, an invitation now for people who are interested to get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you. I'm going to be working on um, bringing some um, concrete examples now, I hope, to, to actually see where people can uh, see alignment with their own work uh, and bring to life the guidance uh, in the real world setting. Um, and so we'd like to see um, developing some explainers, toolkits, uh, all sorts of um, learning type materials that will really hope, help to um, bring this guidance to bear on all the activities uh, that people can see are useful. Um, and of course, what we recognise is that the actual impact of the guidance will only be seen when we begin to embed them into people's everyday experiences and workflows when working throughout the whole trial. So getting in touch, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we are now we have our, a newly launched website you can see here. Uh, we'd like to speak to everyone who's who's been listening today and everyone in the sessions um, who um, is working within the trial system and would really like to, to start these conversations. We're on Twitter and LinkedIn. You've got all our contact details there. So we'd love to hear from you. And as I said, the details on the guidance um, can be downloaded um, and a little bit more about the development and the evolution and our collaborative way of working with a writing group to produce it uh, is all available on the website. So thank you very much for the opportunity to, to share this with you. Um, I'm going to be, this is obviously a recording, I'm going to be in the session with our team lead Nick Medhurst um, and we'll be happy to answer questions and to, to speak to you then. Looking forward to it. Thank you.